Fungi are actually a very diverse group of multicellular organisms. We commonly know them as mushrooms, but there are several other different types of fungi that exist. And just like animals, they are chemo-organoheterotrophs. But where animals ingest their food, fungi feed by absorbing their nutrients straight from the source. They can absorb nutrients from living things, but their most important ecosystem service is when they consume dead organisms. If fungi didn't consume dead organisms, our forest would look a lot different. Instead of walking on the soil, we'd be walking on millions of years of fallen trees, thousands of feet thick. And not only do decomposers provide us with clear hiking trails, perhaps more importantly, they break down living things so that their chemicals held within them can be utilized by the living. The dead sacrifice for the living. In terrestrial environments, fungi are the dominant decomposer in the world, and they recycle everything. While their most important function is to break down tissues from dead organisms, they're also really important in directly helping the living. And fungi can form a mutualistic relationship with the roots of nearly all plant species. While only a small proportion of all species of plants have been examined, 95% of those plant species are predominantly mycorrhizal. And what does mycorrhizal mean? Well, myco is Greek for fungi, and the study of fungi is called mycology. And rhizi is also Greek, and it means root, so literally it translates to fungal root. This mutualistic association provides the fungus with relatively constant and direct access to carbohydrates, such as glucose and sucrose. The carbohydrates are translocated from their source, usually leaves, to root tissue, and on to the plant's fungal partners. In return, the plant gains the benefits of the mycelium's higher absorptive capacity for water and mineral nutrients due to a comparatively large surface area of fungus, thus improving the plant's mineral absorptive capabilities. So in this way, plants are able to extract more water and more nutrients from the soil. Some plant roots are incapable of taking up a very important chemical, phosphate. Phosphate is important in the making of nucleic acids and in ATP synthesis. The P stands for phosphate, and without phosphate, it'd be like a baker trying to make bread without flour. The mycelium of the mycorrhizal fungus, however, can access phosphorus sources and make them available to plants they colonize. So to summarize, the mechanisms of increased absorption are both physical and chemical. Mycorrhizal mycelia are much smaller in diameter than the smallest root and thus can explore a greater volume of soil, providing a larger surface area for absorption. The carbon cycle is simply how carbons move through the global ecosystem. Recall from Biology 1, carbon is captured in plants during photosynthesis. That carbon serves as the base of the food chain and is the primary food source for all animals on Earth. And that carbon is also used by fungi. In their main function as decomposers, fungi break down plant materials. In fact, they're the only organisms that are really good at breaking down cellulose, the polysaccharides that make up the cell walls of plants. They're also the most dominant organisms on Earth that can break down wood. And wood is made up of a very tough polysaccharide known as lignin. In this process, fungi break down these polysaccharides into smaller organic materials in order to obtain sugars out of them so that they can go through their own life functions. When those sugars are broken down during cellular respiration, carbon dioxide is released into the air. That carbon dioxide can then be reabsorbed by photosynthetic organisms like plants, and then the whole cycle starts over again. You might not have realized it, but fungi are really important to humans. The first antibiotic that was ever discovered came from a fungus grown on an orange, and it's known as penicillin. You might wonder why fungi would have antibacterial properties. Well, the answer is twofold. Just like we know bacteria can cause disease in humans, bacteria can also cause disease in a fungi. And a second reason is that many fungi and bacteria compete for the same resources. So if a fungus can emit a chemical that kills bacteria, it has a significant competitive advantage over them. And we also use the fruiting bodies of fungi for food. And you know them as mushrooms. And there's several varieties. We've got the button mushroom, the portobello, and my personal favorite, the shiitake. Fungi are also essential to the fermentation process that we know and love. 
If it weren't for fungi, you would not be enjoying your Pinot Noir alongside your filet mignon. It would just be grape juice, and your bread would have the consistency of eating sticks, and your cheese would just be rotten milk. But to say our cuisine might be different is really an understatement. Fermentation was so important in human civilization that without it, farming as we know may have turned out a lot different. Before refrigeration, which only came common in the first world countries less than a century ago, cultivated food needed to be stored between harvest. And in most parts of the world, the harvest season only lasted once a year. So mess this process up and you're definitely at the creek without a paddle. And there are really only two ways to store vegetables and seed crops for a long time. First, you could dry out your crops. However, once they're dry, they have to stay dry. And if any moisture comes in contact with them, they can be spoiled. So this method was pretty common in dry climates. In wet climates, a more common way of preserving vegetables and seed crops was pickling. This is the process of preserving food by anaerobic fermentation. This procedure gives the food a salty and sour taste and is really quite common in Asian and European cuisine. Think of kimchi in Korea or sauerkraut in Germany. Both of these were cabbages that have been harvested and pickled, which allows them to be preserved for months. And the reason that pickling allows vegetables to be preserved is that it drops the pH of a mixture to less than 4.6, which is sufficient to kill nearly all bacteria. But fungi do have a dark side. They can also wreak havoc on human crops. Corn is especially susceptible to a disease caused by a fungus. Here's an example of an aptly named corn smut. And when it hits a field, it can damage an entire farm full of corn. And unlike bacteria, fungi are much more difficult to kill with chemicals. Fungi grow in two different ways, unicellular or multicellular. Unicellular fungi are called yeasts. The vegetative form of a multicellular fungus is known as mycelium and they form an extensive network of filamentous hairs that form a branching network that reaches out to absorb nutrients from their food. Let's take a closer look at the mycelium. The vegetative structure of a multicellular fungi is known as its mycelium. It's the structure that obtains food, and it's made up of very, very thin filaments called hyphae. Look at the picture on the right. The big L-shaped structure is actually two root hairs of a plant. The really thin things are the hyphae of the mycelium of that particular type of fungus. As a multicellular organism, fungal cells are able to communicate with each other using chemical messages. In this way, when hyphae grows out and comes across a food source, it senses the food source and communicates with adjacent cells. And the organism will actually put more energy into growing toward that food source. Conversely, once a food source of a fungus is gone, it selectively dies back and puts its resources into consuming another food source or searching out its environment. Hyphae also make up the reproductive structures of fungi. We know them as mushrooms. Feeding hyphae of the mycelium are usually spaced far apart. Hyphae that make up the reproductive structures are densely packed. This allows the fungus to have an upright growth form which gives it the advantage of wind to disperse its reproductive units known as spores. Mycelium is made of long, thin filaments known as hyphae, and the cells of hyphae are connected together end on end by structures known as septa. And there are pores in the septa that allow material to flow between the cells. In this way, individual cells can share resources. This feature is what makes fungi a multicellular organism and not necessarily a colonial organism. Not only are the cells connected together, they can share molecules between them. Of all the multicellular organisms on Earth, fungi have the highest surface area to volume ratio. This means that they can reach out and touch a lot of surface area within a small volume. This makes them really efficient at absorbing food from other organisms, either dead or alive. As we've seen with any great advantage in life, there is a trade-off. And the trade-off for having really high surface area to volume ratio is that these organisms tend to dry out really, really fast. In fungi, the one exception to this is the reproductive structure known as spores. When fungi creates these reproductive structures, they encase them in a really thick and fleshy structure. This protects the offspring from drying out. 
This is so effective that spores can last in a dry environment for months to years. The mycelium, however, needs constant supply of water to remain viable. In a primitive group of fungi known as the chytrids, the reproductive structures can have a whip-like flagella that allows them to move in water. In fact, these fungi are entirely aquatic, and they are the only example of motile fungal cells. A chytrid fungus is actually responsible for a disease in amphibians, principally frogs. Discovered in 1998 in Panama, this disease is known to kill amphibians in really large numbers. In fact, it has been suggested that it is the principal cause for worldwide amphibian decline. The mechanism is not completely understood, but it is thought that the fungus hardens the skin of amphibians, which inhibits respiration, as amphibians breathe through their skin. So basically, this fungus is more or less choking these animals to death. Zygomycetes are another group of fungi. They differ principally by their reproductive structures. In fact, all fungi principally differ by their reproductive structures. These reproductive structures are called zygosporangia, which holds its spores. They are mostly terrestrial in habitat, living in soil or on decaying plant or animal material. The most common example of a zygomycete is bread mold. Its mycelium sends hyphae into the bread to absorb nutrients. In its asexual phase, it develops a bulbous black sporangia on the tips of upright hyphae. And each of the sporangia contains hundreds of spores. As in most zygomycetes, asexual reproduction is the most common form of reproduction in bread mold. Sexual reproduction does occur when two haploid hyphae of different organisms are in close proximity to each other and they can fuse. So these sporangium that are asexual have both diploid and haploid cells within them and then whenever they fuse the new structure is called zoosporangium and you can actually see that there's a bridge between two different organisms. Whenever this happens the haploid organisms or the haploid spores I should say um, within each one of these uh, uh, zoosporangium connect with each other and form a diploid organism. Basically, you can think about this as fungal sex. Basidiomycetes are another group of fungi, and they can be differentiated from the other groups of fungi by their reproductive structures, known as basidia. Basidium literally translates to little pedestal. And that's what they look like, little pedestals. There are specialized spore-producing cells that form at the end of the hyphae. In these cells, Meiosis occurs making haploid cells, cells with a single set of chromosomes. Many of the commonly known fungi are basidiomycetes. Mushrooms, puffballs, smuts, and rust are other examples of basidiomycetes. Ascomycetes are another group of fungi with different reproductive structures. And just like the basidiomycetes reproductive structure is the basidia, the ascomycetes reproductive structure is the ASCII. And ASCII is a Greek word for sac. And that is what the reproductive structures of these fungi look like, sacs. And on average, there's only about eight spores per sac. And if you compare that with the zygosporangium, the zygosporangium has hundreds of cells. So you can kind of see how there's a difference in the reproductive structure. And the basidiomycetes have a single spore, uh, maybe several single spores that are actually uh, connected to the basidia. To the layperson, ascomycetes are not nearly as well known as the basidiomycetes. Perhaps the most well known and definitely most useful is the brewer's yeast. That's what we use to make bread and beer. While brewer's yeast may be the most useful, the morel is highly coveted by mushroom hunters. But make sure you identify it correctly, otherwise you'll be strapped to the toilet for a couple days. Carl Linnaeus is the father of the classification of life on Earth, and he created a two-branch structure used to classify all the organisms that were known in his day. Those two branches were plants and animals. The microscope hadn't even been invented yet, so single-celled organisms weren't even thought about. Linnaeus classified fungi as plants, and the logic was that they grow from the ground just like plants, so they have to be plants. And that logic held for centuries, until the 20th century. When biologists started to say, hey, wait a minute, fungi are really nothing like plants. And they replaced Linnaeus's two domain system with a five kingdom system. 
elevating fungi from a mere subgroup into a kingdom all of its own. It was like a warrior becoming a king. And then we could sequence DNA, and lo and behold, fungi form a monophyletic group with animals. But we can't just rely on DNA. Other bits of evidence also support this relationship. One you might actually be familiar with. Fungal affections afflict humans, and you may have heard of one, athlete's foot. And if you've ever had athlete's foot, you know it's really hard to get rid of. It is thought that the reason it is so difficult to get rid of is due to its close ancestry between humans and fungi. It's difficult to kill fungi without killing the human cells. And bacteria are a lot easier to kill because we can target specific genes that are not closely related to human DNA. Other evidence exists as well. The cell wall of a fungus is made up of a molecule, chitin. This is the same polysaccharide that makes up insects' exoskeletons, as well as your fingernails and hairs. Plant cell walls are made up of cellulose. And just like animals, fungi store glucose as glycogen, whereas plants store them as polysaccharides, like starch. Okay, now here's where it really gets weird. You'd think that fungi that have distinct morphological forms of reproduction should represent morphological similarities in their ancestry. However, this is not the case with the chytrids and the zygotes. Remember, chytrids' reproductive organs are mobile. They have flagella that are whip-like structures that allow them to move, and they have very thin coats due to the fact that they live in an aquatic environment. Whereas the sporangia of a zygomycota have a very tough outer coats. This is an adaptation for reproducing in a terrestrial environment, and without it, the spores would quickly dry out and not be viable. However, the chytrids and zygomycetes do not form two unique monophyletic groups. They form a paraphyletic grouping that is very poorly understood. This means that the actual order of phylogenetic branching with respect to their reproductive structures is not really known. It's thought that the swimming gametes and the zoosporangium evolved more than once, or that both structures were present in an ancestor and lost in certain lineages. But when you really think about it, it's really kind of strange. We haven't really figured out exactly the phylogenetics of, of this group of organisms. But that's not true with the other cases. Basidiomycetes are also known as club fungi, and they do form a monophyletic group, all of which have basidia. Remember, those are pedestal things on which the sporangiums sit. And they're also dikaryotic, meaning that they have two nuclei. The interpretation of this group of fungi all stem from a common ancestor that must have had a basidium and two nuclei. And the ascomycetes are also monophyletic. Remember that these are also known as the sac fungi. They all have a sac that are directly connected to the hyphae. And these species are also dikaryotic, meaning that they have two nuclei. So the interpretation of this group is that the ascus evolved once, and all the ascomycetes stemmed from that common ancestor. And you'll notice that the basidiomycetes and the ascomycetes also stem from a common ancestor. This means that this group, both the basidiomycetes and the ascomycetes, are monophyletic together. And since they both have two nuclei, we can infer that the common ancestor of both of these groups must have been dikaryotic. 